Good afternoon. I'm Henry Brem, the chair of the uh, neurosurgery department, and I'm very honored and delighted to be uh, able to welcome all of you here this afternoon for this extraordinarily special occasion. Um, we, the um, Neurosurgery Pain Research Institute to control, prevent, and eliminate pain uh, has uh, made an enormous impact and difference to Johns Hopkins and uh, to the Department of Neurosurgery. And you'll be hearing a little bit more about that. But one of the uh, um, great outcomes, if we've, we've recruited two extraordinary people uh, to uh, uh, an endowed um, positions, and to this afternoon we'd like to um, honor them and establish those two chairs uh, within the Payne Institute. I do believe that who we choose to recognize and honor does reflect our values, our vision, our hopes and aspirations. So I think that you will see both by the people who uh, the chairs are named for and the people who will be the recipients of those chairs that they represent the highest uh, aspirations and hopes for, for all of us and for our institution. I'd like to now call on uh, Paul B. Rothman, who is the Francis Watt Baker MD and Lennox D. Baker, Jr., MD, Dean of the Medical Faculty of Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine uh, and the Chief Executive Officer of Johns Hopkins Medicine to initiate the program. Thanks, Henry, and thanks everyone for coming today for this wonderful uh, occasion. It's really a pleasure to be here uh, at such a momentous time. So, you know, neurosurgery dates back many years. It actually was initiated here at Johns Hopkins in the early 1900s with Harvey Cushing. And it's been really, uh, since then, also if you think about it, you know, over 100 years that we have been the leaders in neurosurgery research and we remain that today. So it's such a pleasure to, to have um, the George J. Hauer and Sal, and Sal Snyder professorships named here really which came out of a gift which began the Neurosurgery Pain Research Institute at Johns Hopkins, which is to control, prevent, and eliminate pain. So this is a really important gift. The Pain Institute, I think, will allow us to really lead in a field of research which is dear and near to many of our hearts, especially when, and my, for me, my back and my arm. Uh, pain is, uh, 100 million people have pain in this country, severe pain that limits them. It is. Uh, Ten times, uh, four times more, or ten times more common than cancer, and four times more common than diabetes. So it's a pretty common disease, and pain can be very debilitating. So if you think about it, to have a research institute which addresses this really important problem, uh, that for people who, you know, a little Tylenol, a little Advil don't help, and uh, and a little rehab doesn't help, and then you're stuck with people who have chronic debilitating pain. So to try to understand that pain and to try to cure it is something that is the uh, Institute's goal, and I think to do that at Hopkins really is a great setting, because if there's any place that can put forward the resources we can in terms of intellectual and patient care resources to cure this problem, it is Johns Hopkins. And so we're very thankful for the gift uh, that both uh, initiated and endowed this institute and also these two professorships is really a wonderful moment for us here at Johns Hopkins and for neurosurgery. And, and I would like to thank Henry Bram and his leadership here in neurosurgery to have really come up with the concept of this pain institute and now seen it to fruition. So thank you, Henry, for your leadership, for the development team, and for our donors who've really just stepped up at a time and done something that's going to be very, very impactful for the for the country and the world as we tackle this problem of pain. It's great to have David Julius here, who uh, we date back a long time. We were a little bit younger faculty here from UCSF. Thank you, David, for joining us here from UCSF to uh, help us with this. And we have two wonderful faculty getting these chairs. So Alan Bellsberg is one of the leaders in nerve transplant. Uh, he uh, initiated this, uh, Alan, just uh, not that long ago. 
about 10 years ago, a little less than 10 years ago, to do these operations. And uh, think of the impact you can have by saving a child's arm or, or, or leg from um, amputation because of the ability to rest, restore nerves. There. I mean, it's a wonderful thing. And Alan, you're really leading as a physician scientist here. We appreciate that. And then we have Mike Caterini, who you know, deals with pain at this other level, which is really the basic science, which we still don't understand pain in a very basic level, and to take that to really understand the fundamentals and try to cure pain, it's really wonderful. And we have these two wonderful faculty that we're able to now provide these professorships to allow both of you to continue to innovate and make an impact on pain. And that's why you're here at Hopkins, and we're so thankful that we're able to help you with some resources to do that. So congratulations to both of you, to the department, and again, thanks to the donors and everyone involved in these gifts. They're really very, very special. So uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, these uh, professorships are held by the university, so my job as a dean of medicine is to present these to the president of the university. So as dean of the medical faculty, I formally present to you President Daniels, uh, the George J. Howard Professorship in Neurosurgery and the Solomon H. Snyder Professorship in Neurosurgery. Ron. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Paul. I should start and say whenever the Dean of Medicine starts talking about all his various sources of pain, which he does on occasion, but inevitably I find that this then becomes a discussion about the lawyers he's interacting with. And somehow, as a former law professor, there is some distinct role that I can play in alleviating, not compounding his misery. Um, there's no easy fix to that, Paul. So with that, uh, let me uh, just thank Paul for uh, giving me the opportunity to be here. Henry, uh, here we're celebrating two more professorships in the story department within the span of one week. It's truly wonderful, and it's great testament to your leadership and the extraordinary work and promise of this department, so uh, congratulations. I'm delighted to be here with our Hopkins family and friends, as well as so many members of the Snyder, Bellsberg, and Katerina families. And without any further ado, it is my privilege to accept the solemn Nate Snyder and George J. Uh, Hoyer professorships in neurosurgery. This is a truly momentous occasion for our university. We're honoring the legacy of two transformative leaders in the history of Hopkins Medicine. One, George Hoyer, an unsung hero from our past, and one, Solomon Snyder, very much a part of our present, not only in neuroscience, but indeed of the entire university. This is the magic of Saul. Today, we also recognize the power of visionary philanthropy combined with selfless commitment to humanity that brought us to this moment. And we mark our great luck that a national search for the leaders of the Neurosurgery Pain Research Institute revealed that the very best candidates were already here at Hopkins. We celebrate them today as the inaugural Snyder and Hoyer professors in neurosurgery, respectively, Dr. Michael Katerina and Dr. Alan Bellsberg. Now, well, that's good. Let's, let's acknowledge this. Now, at first glance, the reasons to select these two Hopkins legends at namesakes for the professorship seem obvious. George Hoyer was a trailblazing figure in the early years of neurosurgery in America, a renowned surgeon and academic leader. He not only changed the landscape of the brain, uh, brain surgery, but also helped transform the way that surgery was and still is taught around the country. And of course, Saul Snyder is the undisputed godfather of the field of neuroscience as we know it. Uh, that's the moniker. I don't know if you're entirely comfortable with this godfather, but um, we'll run with it. His transformative studies of tr neurotransmitters in the brain, including the discovery of the Brady Kenine receptor connected to, brain tr uh, to pain transmission, launched, as we well know, a cascade of discoveries, discoveries, opened countless new fields of study, and undergird so much of the important work that is done today at the Neuroscience Pain, uh, Neurosurgery Pain Research Institute. But looking deeper, a different connection can be found in the descriptions of both of the men we honor in these professorships, emerging from very different quarters. In a wonderful article about George Hoyer, uh, Raphael Tamargo and his co-author quote Dr. William Halstead on Hoyer's surgical practice. According to Halstead, Hoyer operated quote, beautifully, tranquilly, honestly. 
Now, you can't help but be moved by this description of Hoyer at the table exuding a powerful equanimity as he performs feats of surgical invention. He was getting the job done very gracefully. Now, fast forward several decades, a Baltimore Sun reporter described Saul Snyder in these terms, quote, as exuding an air of calm most people can only attain when they're on vacation. Needless to say, Saul was not on vacation, neither was he giving the slightest hint of the pace scope and magnitude of the discoveries emanating out of his lab. Though working in disparate fields and decades apart, it is clear that these men share a self-effacing calm, a tranquility that is tethered to a fearless, creative, and boundless energy for innovation. And indeed, this ethos is what we celebrate today in our inaugural recipients. Their work carries on the legacy of invention and discovery that is, simply put, just in a day's work. And most importantly, as Saul Snyder has remarked, all in the service of making people feel better. Like his advisor, Saul Snyder, Dr. Michael Katerina lives that ethos to the fullest, recognized around the world for his work. Dr. Katerina has been instrumental in illuminating the biochemical underpinnings of pain. With his identification of the TRPV1 ion channel, Dr. Katerina has opened new avenues, not simply for developing new methods to manage pain, but also deepening our understanding of the underlying mechanisms that control pain response. His research has guided us to more precise understanding of how pain works in the human body so that we can anticipate how patients will respond to pain uh, and perhaps uh, do so even before it starts. In his co-director, uh, Alan Bellsberg, we see a similar fusion of steady determination, courage, and creativity. And I would say these are all traits to be expected in a Canadian export. Um, <laughs> consider one of Dr. Bellsberg's cases, a young veteran of war in Afghanistan who was suffering excruciating pain in a paralyzed left arm, pain that, quote, made him feel like he had a, uh, was having a torch rolled across his arm and indeed no one was able to alleviate, causing him even to go so far as to contemplate suicide. That was until he came to Johns Hopkins. After a rare and complex surgery performed by Dr. Bellsberg, the young soldier woke up free of pain, almost if he were in another universe. And stories like these are legion in Dr. Bellsberg's very illustrious career. Of course, none of this work would be possible without the visionary commitment of an anonymous supporter, a family who understands intimately the debilitating effects of chronic pain, and wanted to make a quiet yet profound impact on the lives of others. Their gift launched the Neurosurgery Pain Research Institute, and with it, the professorships now occupied by its co-directors. Like those we celebrate today, the mission of this institute is one that is decidedly not flashy. Too often, pain is something that is regarded as inevitable, as unavoidable, something just to be stoically endured. Yet I am certain that Dr. Katerina and Dr. Bellsberg's quiet determination and creativity will continue to trans research, transform research and care in the years to come, moving us inexorably toward a world free of pain. We owe a debt of gratitude to George Hoyer and, of course, to Saul Snyder for laying such an extraordinary foundation on which to build these efforts. And to the Hoyer and Snyder Professorships of Neurosurgery, Dr. Alan Bellsberg and Dr. Michael Katerina, on behalf of Johns Hopkins University, I offer my heartiest congratulations. Thank you. I'd like to take a few moments um, before we start with the chairs to give you an overview of how the Neurosurgery Pain Research Institute to control, prevent, and eliminate pain came into being and uh, uh, why we're all here and, and how this evolved. Uh, I might start by talking about a, a somewhat um, more well-known uh, institute, the Armstrong Institute for Patient Safety, which was established uh, with Peter Pronovost as the director and with a $10 million gift from Michael Armstrong. Now, for those of you who know this story, that uh, the Safety Institute, which has had an enormous impact both at Hopkins and worldwide on changing the awareness in the way that we look at patient safety, came from a tragedy uh, that occurred here at, uh, at uh, Johns Hopkins 
There was a young girl, Josie King, who was about six years old, uh, who had a medical illness and an error was made um, in the medication that she received and she died. And um, the parents were distraught. Um, it was incredibly frustrating and nightmarish for all the physicians and nurses uh, and friends uh, who uh, knew her. Um, and in fact, there are neighbors of, of ours uh, just a few houses away from our house. And there was this tremendous sense of anger and loss at this child that was so needlessly lost. And if I can just quote that her mother uh, realized that she had died as a result of a medical error, her mother, Sorrel King, um, uh, chose to convert that uh, pain and anger uh, into something very positive to help other people, other children and other people to prevent these type of things from happening. And if I can just quote from the Hopkins Magazine in 2004 that um, says that even in her darkest moments, however, Sorrell recognized that no one had intended to hurt her daughter. Furthermore, Hopkins was listening. At some point, someone said to us, anger can do two things. It will make you rot away and expect pity forever and ever or you can take the energy from your anger and let it propel you forward. And from that came the Armstrong Institute for, for Patient Safety, and with that, countless lives have been saved by procedures that have uh, uh, changed the way we look at systems problems within hospitals and medical institutions. Well, um, our uh, donors, to the Pain Institute had a, a different situation, but very analogous. Uh, more than 25 years ago, our, our principal donor had spine surgery, and my understanding is it was simple spine surgery that went bad and had a bad outcome. And uh, he uh, later suffered multiple other operations uh, for arachnoiditis, scar tissue, uh, all sorts of techniques, saw the best people in the world, was treated at least for part of that time here at Johns Hopkins more than 25 years ago. And all of it led to, to nowhere. I mean, it just, he continued to deteriorate and deteriorate, continued to have more and more incapacitating neuropathic uh, pain, which was the worst curse imaginable because he stayed alive but could hardly move, could hardly function. And this was a vibrant, extraordinary human being uh, before this. Um, he had, um, he and his wife had um, made a contribution to the department at the time to try to help spine research. Um, and then uh, after I became chair, I visited them and uh, we had a very, we had a delightful conversation because they're, they're wonderful people. Um, but at one conversation that I had, we became very good friends and, and really spoke about it. One conversation has never left me because I've never been able to get over it and I've never been able to find an answer. And that is, um, he said to me, how do you surgeons live with yourselves when you do an operation that 90% of the time alleviates pain and is successful and really helps people. And they come in, they have a problem, they can't walk, it's incapacitating pain, and they, you cure the problem. And he said probably about 9% of the time you don't make a difference. You do the operation, you try your best, um, but, um, uh, but you know it doesn't help, but it doesn't make things worse. And he said and then 1% of the time you destroy people. You know, even though your intentions are good and you're trying to help all those other people, take someone like himself, and he said, my life was ruined. I would have gladly have lived with the pain that I had before all this started if I would have known that this would be the outcome. And I was very troubled by that. I mean, it's, it's actually, uh, in some way, we don't like to think about that as surgeons and as physicians because that's true for brain tumor surgery. We help an enormous number of people, but there are risks, and sometimes someone's worse than when we operate on them. Uh, it's true for medical problems. Sometimes you give a medicine for problem A, and then there's an untoward effect, and it's devastating. So we, the question is, how do you cope with that, and how do you eliminate that? And what 
our donors said, and, and what a, you know, our society, what do you do? You sue the doctor, sue the hospital. You know, it's a bad outcome. It must be somebody's fault. Somebody must be blamed. But I have to say that never came from, from this gentleman, uh, extraordinary gentleman. And what he said is, there must be a way to do better. You must be able to find a way that you don't hurt people when you're trying to help them. He said, I know your intentions were good. And it wasn't talking about me, obviously, but the people who first operated on him. Everybody had good intentions, but it was a bad outcome. There must be a better way. Find it. And he said that I'm going to give you resources that if you can fundamentally look at this problem, surgical preventing and eliminating surgical pain and surgical mishaps like that. And I felt this was an enormous challenge, and we, we discussed how much, and you know, uh, their initial gift was a million dollars, and I was swept away. It was the largest gift that anybody had given, and I was very touched and moved. And I kept thanking him, and he said, you know, I read the papers, I know. He said, a million dollars doesn't mean anything anymore today. He said, uh, you know, I look at MIT, his, you know, where, where he was familiar with, and he said, they get $100 million gifts to look at brain sciences and so on. And I said, you know, that, that's a good point, and that would, be, that would be much more appropriate, but we're very grateful for whatever, you know, whatever we get. We're working towards that, but a million at a time will lead us there eventually. And then we had another uh, meeting, and uh, we did talk about what, it would, what would happen if we had $100 million for a pain institute at Hopkins, and what would we do, and how we, could we change it, and what basic science forces could we unleash, what clinical forces, how would we look at the problem. And we put together an idea, an institute, and um, what uh, the donor called, and it was, I remember vividly, it was in April of 2011, and they said that they had decided to go forward, and they said my $100 million figure, which of course was their figure, was ridiculous, uh, that they wouldn't do anything like that, but that they would start with a $25 million gift to form an institute to, uh, for Neurosurgery Pain Research Institute to control, prevent, and eliminate pain. And, um, and that they want to see if we accomplish what we did. And they said that if we did, they'd be willing to, to continue to add to that. And they also expected us to encourage other people to add to that so that this was a national effort and uh, that they want to see this as the beginning of something and that they would continue to help support that. And in fact, as, and I'll mention briefly some of the things we've done. So that not only said, yes, we, we have these resources, but it really made me feel that we need to deliver. We need to do exactly what we promised to do. <clears throat> that, of course, comes through having the right people, and that's what today is really about. Um, and, and I have to say, through the generosity of these donors, that uh, the next year they, they made another $5 million gift, uh, which is really essentially these two endowed chairs. And uh, we are moving very much forward with uh, uh, with meeting those goals. Now, those are very audacious goals because pain is universal and it's very hard to eliminate pain. But there are preventable causes and there are ways of better understanding so that we can do a much, much better job than we currently do. I, I will say it's not an accident that I'm not mentioning the name of the donors, but I think that that's, you know, when giving in charity, one would say that the highest form is to do it without seeking any recognition or uh, accolades for oneself, but rather purely for the objective of, of meeting the goals of, of why you give a uh, philanthropic or charitable donation. And, and I will say, too, that the, the donor who, who unfortunately has passed away and didn't live to see this moment or some of the other accomplishments that we will have um, did not do this to, to, you know, he was very blunt, he said that, I want basic science done in this, and I want really fundamental changes. And I don't think that it's going to benefit me, but I think it's important that this not happen to other people, and that you do the research and do the work to make it change for others. So I'm in awe of, of people like that, and I have an enormous sense of gratitude. I know we all share that in the room, and, and uh, just in any way possible, I have my gratitude and, and thankfulness. 
The uh, institute was formed in 2011. Um, and one of the first things that, that we did is that um, uh, I actually became the first uh, sort of acting director because I wanted to make sure that exactly what the donors wanted would be fulfilled. And I had enough conversations that I felt that I knew what direction it needed to go. And we formed an advisory board which was uh, chaired by Gary Goldstein, the president of Krieger Kennedy Institute. We took the best people that we could identify in the pain area in the, uh, on, from the faculties of all the schools, from the nursing school, the School of Public Health, uh, from Bayview, from Hopkins. Um, Sal Snyder was on that uh, advisory board, remains on that advisory board. And we hired an international search company to look for who are the best people to lead this uh, uh, new institute at Johns Hopkins. And we, in fact, brought in people from all over the world uh, to interview and to give their ideas. And actually, not only did we meet some great people, but they helped us also formulate what it is that we should be accomplishing. When you have great people come in and say what they would do, you sort of get a blueprint of what can be done. And, and we did that. And we hired a number of people, and I'm just going to mention three, uh, that we hired Bobby Norris, who, who is here in the back, who's a, a neurocritical care nurse, and one of our leading nurses in, in neurosurgery, who had gotten specialty training in pain. And a very interesting thing happened. She formed a pain team that rounded on every one of our patients. We, there, there's something called Press Ganey scores, which is a way of looking at uh, patient satisfaction when they leave the hospital with the way they were taken care of. And we generally get very, very high scores in neurosurgery and at Johns Hopkins for the food, for the doctors, for all the different things that are there. On pain management, we got about the second percentile. And the second percentile is not good, it's bad. And we, we excused ourselves with that, and we excused ourselves to, to Mr. Peterson and his colleagues, because we said, well, you have to understand, we see the hardest pain patients in the world. These are chronic pain, they've had multiple operations. We have brain tumor patients with pain, and we can't really treat them aggressively because they, we could affect the pressure in their brain, and so we have to be very delicate with the pain medicines. And so we accept a really poor patient score because it's for safety. We're just trying to take good care of these patients. Well, Bobby Norris was on the job with, uh, with another uh, person that we hired from the pharmacy, and they rounded on every patient. They used modern, you know, uh, individualized techniques. And our scores went from 2 percentile to 96 percentile in four months. So we were wrong. We could do a much better job. And thanks to Bobby and her team in the Pain Institute, that changed immediately. There's also data, and we're looking at it, that if you eliminate acute pain, you reduce the amount of chronic pain. So one way to prevent problems in long term is just simply to do better treat our patients. The other person that we brought in is Jabu Yi, who's a, a, a biostatistician. And just to make a, she, we recruited her from the oncology center. And just to make a long story short, we now have 14 open clinical trials in the Department of Neurosurgery, and every one of them has an endpoint of pain. We, we never, for our brain tumor or vascular or other trials, we, we, we looked at survival. Are we keeping people alive? Are we not keeping them alive? Uh, and things like that. We now, and Shabu is, is, is sitting here and deserves enormous amount of praise, uh, um, we now use pain as the criterion. Are we improving quality of life? Are we taking care of the pain as well with these aggressive new therapies? And we also, in our animal trials, are looking at pain as an endpoint. And finally, um, um, Shi Zhang Dang from neuroscience has been recruited into the Pain Institute and the Neurosurgery Department who really has developed a whole new mechanism in molecular basis for pain, and that's going to lead to a clinical trial that we're going to sponsor through the Pain Institute. So I think that even in this short amount of time, we have seen a change, and it's the foundation for what I think is going to be very major changes in, in accordance with my best interpretation of what our donors really wanted to see, which is a fundamental improvement in the understanding and treatment of pain. The two endowed chairs are the other byproduct of that, and we did recruit two outstanding people, and um, I'd like to 
you know, for the remainder of the time, talk about the endowed chairs. And the first chair is for our clinical director uh, and um, Professor Rafael Tamargo, who's the Walter E. Dandy Professor of Neurosurgery uh, in the Department of Neurosurgery, is going to present the significance of the George J. Hauer um, chair and his role in the history of neurosurgery. Thank you very much, Dr. Brem. I would like to join everyone uh, by congratulating Dr. Belsberg and Dr. Caterino for this uh, honor. Um, I thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, today. And um, I would like to start by detailing Dr. George Hoyer's contributions to neurosurgery. Dr. Hoyer was a neurosurgical pioneer who attended the Hopkins School of Medicine, trained in surgery at Hopkins, and spent almost half of his professional career at Hopkins. He was a colleague of both Harvey Cushing and Walter Dandy. While at Hopkins, Hoyer developed some of the fundamental concepts and procedures of modern neurosurgery, whereas Cushing and Dandy went on to focus their energies in neurosurgery Hoyer pursued a diverse career in general surgery and resident education, but he never lost his initial interest in neurosurgery. Dr. Hoyer made his most significant contribution to neurosurgery in 1914 when he invented a frontotemporal operation to approach tumors of the anterior skull base. In 1931, he wrote a definitive treatise on the surgical treatment of tumors around the optic apparatus. Hoyer's frontotemporal craniotomy was an elegant and sophisticated surgical solution that had eluded other neurosurgical pioneers, such as Fedor Krauss of Germany, Charles Fraser of the University of Pennsylvania, <coughs> and his uh, mentor Cushing himself. It is clear that he taught it directly to two other neurosurgical pioneers, namely Walter Dandy and Alfred Adson, chairman at the Mayo Clinic. This contribution alone would have been sufficient to warrant including Hoyer among the founders of a specialty. This approach, which today is known as the terrinal craniotomy, has enabled neurosurgeons to treat hundreds of thousands of patients with skull-based tumors, aneurysms, and several other pathologies. By the end of his career in 1947, Hoyer had written 17 articles dealing with cranial, spinal, and peripheral nerve surgery, which demonstrated his expertise within the entire spectrum of neurosurgical disease. Now that you know about Hoyer's specific contributions, I would like to provide you with his biographical background. Hoyer was born in February 19, uh, 1882 in Madison, Wisconsin. He was the son of German immigrants. He completed his undergraduate studies at the University of Wisconsin between 1899 and 1903. He then enrolled at the Hopkins School of Medicine in 1903 and obtained his MD with honors in 1907. During his time as a medical student, Hoyer sought out research opportunities in surgery. Because of his work, his first paper was published during his third year as a medical uh, student in the bulletin of the Johns Hopkins Hospital. It dealt with the pancreatic ducts in the cat. Hoyer met Cushing as a medical student and started to work in Cushing's Hunterian laboratory. In 1907, he started a grueling surgical residency under William Halstead at Hopkins, which he completed in an amazing five years. He spent his first year as intern, however, working almost exclusively under Harvey Cushing, and this influenced his affinity for the expertise in the body specialty of neurosurgery. When Cushing left for Boston in 1912, Hoyer stayed at Johns Hopkins and acquired the responsibility for the neurosurgical work. In addition to his general surgery duties and his research activities in the Hunterian laboratory, he developed a large neurosurgery practice. From 1912 to, until 1914, Hoyer busily operated both in general surgery and the new area of concentration, neurosurgery. He grouped an extensive experience with intracranial operations, which he described in a 1916 publication, again at the Bulletin of the Johns Hopkins Hospital, entitled a report of 70 cases of brain tumors. He met Walter Dandy in 1911 and continued Dandy's training in neurosurgery, which had been started by Cushing. Hoyer was three years ahead of Dandy in the residency. At the outbreak of World War I, 
Hoyer was commissioned as a captain in the medical corps of the American Expeditionary Forces, and over five years, from 1914 to 1919, he served as a chief surgeon in evacuation hospital number 10, heading the surgical section of the Hopkins Medical and Surgical Unit in France. He returned to Hopkins in 1919 to find that Dandy had become the go-to person for neurosurgery. Having attained the rank of major, Hoyer was discharged from the military in February of 1919 and returned to Hopkins, having expected to be appointed chief of neurosurgery. To his deep disappointment, he discovered that his former junior resident, Dandy, had been named by Halstead to a position of neurosurgery chief. Hoyer then focused his attentions on general surgery at Hopkins. In 1922, three years after his return to Hopkins from France, with the support of his mentor, Halstead, and with ambitions of creating a strong department of surgery and a residency training program, Hoyer accepted the Christian Holmes Chair of Surgery at the University of Cincinnati. Hoyer's accomplishment in Cincinnati became known throughout the academic world, and he was then offered a new chair. When the Board of Governors of Cornell established the New York Hospital and decided to create residencies on all services for the opening of their new hospital in 1932, they contacted Hoyer to become Chief of Surgery and to establish the form of training that he had instituted in Cincinnati. Hoyer accepted the post and moved to New York in 1932 where he would remain Chief of Surgery at the New York Hospital Cornell Medical College Center until his retirement 15 years later in 1947. After leaving New York, Hoyer and his wife moved to a 1,000-acre ranch here in Maryland to raise Angus cattle and enjoy duck hunting and fishing. Unfortunately, his retirement lasted only a brief three years, and he died in 1950 from a myocardial infarction at the age of 68 years. He's buried in his wife's family land in Fincastle, Virginia. So this is a brief uh, biography of this remarkable man. Um, and again, I want to join everyone um, celebrating today the uh, uh, position for Dr. Brelsberg and Dr. Caterino. Thank you. As director of the Department of Neurosurgery, there are few duties that I'm privileged to perform that are more gratifying and more enjoyable than the recognition of an accomplished member of our faculty. What makes today's recognition of Alan Bellsberg even more wonderful is the creation of the endowed George J. Hoyer Chair in Neurosurgery to bestow upon him. It is possible that some of you may be wondering given Alan's exceptional achievements at Hopkins for more than two decades, why it has taken so long to accord him this honor. Maybe an even more perplexing question is why it has taken far longer, 92 years to be precise, to honor George Hoyer. As a colleague of Harvey Cushing's and Walter Dandy, as you've heard from, from Raphael, he was one of the founders of modern neurosurgery here before leaving in 1922 to become the head of general surgery at the University of Cincinnati and then at Cornell. Perhaps such long overdue honors, both for Allen and for George Hoyer, are all the more impressive because they have the benefit of perspective. The luster of the records has only been enhanced by time. It is firmly established, clear, and unchallenged that Hoyer was a giant in neurosurgery. And Alan Bellsberg's stature continues to grow even greater as his research and clinical success in treating the causes of devastating nerve and spinal pain become far more widely known. No matter how long it may take for appropriate recognition to be given, those whom we honor reflect not only what we value, but whom we aspire to emulate. Both George Hoyer and Alan Bellsberg are just such exemplars. Retiring in 1947, Hoyer planned to write a biography of Halstead but his ill health prevented him from completing that project, and he died of a heart attack in 1950. Now, 64 years after his death, George Hoyer finally is receiving the recognition that he deserves here at Hopkins with the establishment of an endowed chair in his honor. And now, 22 years after he joined the neurosurgery faculty, Alan Bellsberg is receiving the public recognition that he long has merited 
for bringing imagination and insight to the, to the laboratory, inspiration to the classroom, and compassionate care to his patients. Pain is the universal affliction. Everyone experiences it. Fortunately, many of us have it only briefly. Others aren't so lucky. They may endure it for a lifetime, yet many of the origins of attractable pain remains mysterious and successful methods for treating it can be elusive. Pain is one of the most common reasons that people um, seek the care of a neurosurgeon, and no one is more determined, imaginative, and adept at developing and implementing novel neurosurgical approaches to combating intractable pain than Alan Belsberg. Born in Montreal, Alan obtained his bachelor's degree in physiology and physiological psychology at the University of British Columbia in 1978. His medical degree from the University of Calgary, he interned at McGill, and then completed his neurosurgical residency and research fellowship at Calgary. Alan Bellsberg arrived at Hopkins in 1990 with a prestigious McLaughlin Foundation grant to spend two years undertaking molecular biology research on neuronal receptors along with clinical training in spine and peripheral nerve surgery as a fellow under the mentorship of then the vice chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery, James Campbell, who is with us today. Thank you. And um, he was invited by Department Director Don Long uh, to join the faculty in 1992. During the ensuing two decades, Allen has been one of the Department of Neurosurgery's brightest stars. He's an exceptional physician, academician, who excels as a clinician, researcher, program builder, and educator. He's made enormous advances in treating conditions centered within the peripheral nervous system, both for adults and children, earning local, national, and international renown. Patients travel from across the country and the world to avail themselves to his surgical knowledge and skill of repairing injured nerves, removing nerve tumors, decompressing nerve entrapments, combating degenerative spine problems, excising tumors of the spine, and creating landmark procedures for nerve transplantation and transfers, as well as spinal cord, dorsal root, entry zone lesion surgery. <clears throat> as director of the neurosurgery department's peripheral nerve division, Allen teaches not only medical students and residents at Hopkins, but other surgeons and even the public through numerous appearances on local and national media about this demanding and complex specialty. He has been particularly influential as a mentor to many medical students and postgraduates, not only here but throughout the country, as an author of the publication Resident Curriculum Guidelines for Neurosurgery. And I would say that he speaks at every national and international major neurosurgery meeting and educating other neurosurgeons about this uh, specialized area of neurosurgery. Allen is a visionary leader. He has been the co-founder of the Multidisciplinary Neurofibromatosis Center at Hopkins. He's established the International Schwannomatosis Database here, and now is the inaugural clinical director um, of the uh, Hopkins Neurosurgery Pain Research Institute. It is with a profound gratitude to the benefactors who have endowed the George J. Howard professorship and immense pride in the outstanding research, teaching, and medical care that, is for so, that has for so long distinguished the career of Alan Bellsberg at Johns Hopkins, that I thank all of them for everything that they have done and are doing to ensure our Department of Neurosurgery remains among the finest in the world. I welcome Alan Bellsberg uh, to this new position. Um, thank you very much for that introduction, Dr. Bram. Thank you, Dr. Tamargo, for uh, your historical comments on uh, Dr. Hoyer. I also thank Dr. Hoyer's family for allowing us uh, the honor of having a professorship in his name, and I certainly thank them that I'm the inaugural, uh, hold the inaugural professorship. President Daniels, uh, Dean Rothman, board members, distinguished guests, all of you. Um, for those of you who know me well, you know that usually I put together my presentations, my talks, about 15 minutes before I have to give them. And for speeches that aren't scientific, I usually wing them. Well, uh, Dr. Katerina and Kim made it very clear I'm not allowed to do that for this auspicious occasion, so I actually had to write it. So now I have to kind of read it, because I did write it. 
Well, good speeches are usually timely. So to begin with, how about them O's? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, perhaps a little lesser talked about, but equally important thing going on in the public these days are the announcement of the various Nobel Prizes. So with that in mind, I will try to remain uh, timely in mentioning some of the Nobel Prizes and what's going on, but specifically looking at it from a historical point of view. First and foremost, Hemingway's Nobel Prize speech began with having no facility for speech making and no command of oratory nor any domination of rhetoric, I wish to thank the administration of the generosity of Alfred Nobel for this prize. Let me say I am no Hemingway, so this speech will not be anything like that. So just set back, go to sleep if you want. I'll do the best I can. To begin with, I truly hate pain. Everything about pain. I don't think there's anything good about pain. To quote the NIH in its description of pain, in its most benign form, it warns us that something isn't quite right, that we should take medicine or see a doctor. At its worst, however, Pain robs us of our productivity, it, our well-being, and for many of us suffering from extended illness, our very lives. Pain is a complex perception that differs enormously among individual patients, even those who appear to have identical injuries or illnesses. Nobel laureate Albert Schweitzer stated in his presentation, pain is a more terrible lord of mankind than even death itself. Today, pain has become the universal disorder, a serious and costly public health issue, and a challenge for family, friends, and healthcare providers who must give support to the individual suffering from the physical as well as the emotional consequences of pain. To put it in some sort of perspective, the NIH, and this is off the current NIH site, estimates from public health burden of pain affects one-third of America's population at an annual cost of between $560 billion and $635 billion a year in the United States alone. But pain, in all of its glory, pain is a very individual experience. It's something that our Neurosurgery Pain Research Institute donor experienced firsthand, something our donor suffered with. To follow up on the comments from Dr. Brim about our donor, rather than allow pain to consume his life, he and his wife look for ways to battle back. He put up with medications and surgical interventions that were simply inadequate. Again, rather than condemn the medical community for our lack of skills, the couple chose to empower the medical community by providing a transformative financial commitment. The funding was done anonymous, without ego, but with great purpose, challenging us to, quote, control, prevent, and eliminate neurosurgical-related pain. On behalf of Johns Hopkins Neurosurgical Pain Research Institute and the numerous collaborators that have come together under the Institute, the individual patients who will benefit from this work, our deepest gratitude to our donors. For those of you who have touched my life in many, many ways since I became a neurosurgeon, and you all know who you are out there, I am truly grateful for all of you done. But certainly there are some of you who really need special mention. James Sumner's speech at the Nobel Banquet, 1946. We American scientists appreciate the unique characteristics of the Nobel Prize awards, which are restricted neither by international frontiers, time, race, nor sex. I personally thank the Johns Hopkins community, including its board of trustees and leadership, for accepting into their ranks a foreigner and allowing me to participate in this great institution of learning and healing. What do you say, eh? <laughs> Never apologize for being the Canadian. <laughs> there are great scientists at Johns Hopkins in the, or oh, sorry, three great scientists collaborated at Johns Hopkins in the 1980s, 90s, and into the 21st century, producing numerous discoveries in the field of pain research. James Campbell, Richard Meyer, and Srinivaraja were and remain giants in the field. I began my career with them and hope to continue my career in a manner that will make them proud. James Campbell has taught me and mentored me in science, in medicine, and even on the squash court. I thank all these three truly distinguished Hopkins greats for all that I've been able to achieve. I also recognize that perhaps at times I was not the easiest of mentees. 
And I will quote James Watson delivering his 1962 Nobel Address for Watson and Crick. I knew many people, at least when I was young, who thought I was quite unbearable. Some also thought Maurice was very strange, and others, including myself, thought that Francis was at times difficult. Fortunately, we were working among wise and tolerant people who understood the spirit of scientific discovery and the conditions necessary for its generation. I feel that it is very important, especially for us so singularly honored, to remember that science does not stand by itself, but is the creation of very human people. Again, I thank Drs. Campbell, Richard Meyer, and Srinivaraja for my training and for all of the things they contributed to me being a success. The Neurosurgery Pain Research Institute, under the leadership of Dr. Katerina, has become a mecca of collaboration. He and I have spent untold hours trying to bring down the walls that separate people and the laboratories and have fostered an environment of trust, collaboration, and the excitement that therefore develops from that. I thank all of the collaborators, so many of you who are in the audience today, who participate in our numerous research efforts. It's all about the collaboration that makes this a very successful and very productive environment. Some people, however, really do need to be singled out. Eli Wiesel, Wiesel in 1986, in his Nobel presentation, stated, there is so much injustice and suffering crying out for our attention, victims of hunger and racism and political persecution. There is so much to be done. There is so much that can be done. One person, a, Ru a Ruel Wallenberg, an Albert Schweitzer, a Martin Luther King Jr., one person of integrity can make a difference, a difference of life and death. Well, I can say that one such person, a person of great integrity, a person of great intellect, and a person of great humanity, is fortunately at the helm of the Neurosurgery Pain Research Institute, a person I get to be co-director with and to call my friend. Michael Craterina, I congratulate you on the Saul Snyder Professorship. There are those who teach and inspire us, guide us and mentor us. They are our colleagues and our boss. They give us praise when we do well and we spend couch time with them when we screw up. Indeed, the chairperson sets the tone and has a dramatic impact on the success of a department. Dr. Don Lenlong had been an, inspiration, or sorry, an inspirational chairman to me. He was and is a Renaissance man, and even today, well into his 80s, he could not make today's activities as he would, and Harriet, having just attended the International Association for the Study of Pain, are off exploring an exotic venue in South America. Henry Brem took over the leadership role and has truly made Johns Hopkins neurosurgery into what many would consider to be simply the best overall neurosurgery department in the world. The research, the breadth of clinical work, and the extent of educational activities the department truly flourishes. Dr. Brem has been successful because he has married God-given talent with humility, with poise, and a deep appreciation of the individual and family. Kofi Annan, in his Nobel speech, stated, we understand as never before that each of us is fully worth of the respect and dignity essential to our common humanity. We recognize that we are all products of many cultures, traditions, and memories, that mutual respect allows us to study and learn from other cultures, and that we gain strength by combining the foreign with the familiar. Dr. Brem truly lives these words, bringing respect and warmth to each member of the department, regardless of their station in life. The Dalai Lama, receiving his Nobel Prize, stated, I pray for all of us, oppressor and friend, that together we succeed in building a better world through human understanding and love, and in that in doing so, we may reduce the pain and suffering of all beings. Dr. Bram, your ability to bring us together in scientific rigor and discovery with a genuine compassion and empathy for the individual, while perhaps escaping the notice of the Nobel Committee, is blatantly clear to all of us who work for and work with you. On behalf of the community, I congratulate you on your recent Brem professorship. I personally thank you for your continued support of my research, clinical and educational career, and for always being in my corner. And then there is family, including those related by birth, marriage, by friendship, by living next door, those above and those below ground. To my brother Brian, my sister Marilyn, my sons Micah and Adam, my mother-in-law Maria, 
my sister-in-law, PJ. You helped me to regain hope after despair, restart journeys after detours, resurrect dreams after rejection, and just plain enjoy life. Thank you for making the journey to be here today. It, makes, it really does mean the world to me. And finally, to Lorinda. You are the best thing that happened to me. You are the best thing that is still happening to me. And you are the best thing that will ever happen to me. If there was a number higher than a billion, zillion, quadrillion, I would thank you that many number of times. And everything you have done for me and everything you still do for me, I love you very much. To all of those who I should be thanking and have failed to do so, I do now, except for the people in the top row. <laughs> it is with a profound sense of humility that I accept the honor of the George H. Hewer Professorship in Neurosurgery. Thank you very much. It's very beautiful. Um, it's a pleasure for me now to introduce uh, my good friend, Dr. Richard Huguenayer, uh, to um, begin the uh, Sal Snyder Professorship. Dr. Huguenayer is professor and director of the Solomon H. Snyder Department of Neurosciences, as well as an investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Uh, he has joint appointments in the Department of Biological Chemistry and Department of Pharmacology. Dr. Huguenayer completed his undergraduate work at Biochemistry at Vassar College in 1975, his PhD in Biochemistry, Molecular, and Cell Biology from Cornell in 82, where he performed his thesis research in a laboratory of Dr. Ephraim Racker. He was a postdoctoral fellow with Nobel laureate Dr. Paul Greengard at Yale uh, from 1982 to 84, and then moved to the Rockefeller University, where he was an assistant professor of Molecular and Cellular Neurobiology from 84 to 88. <clears throat> Rick Huguenier became the director of the Solomon Snyder Department of Neuroscience in 2006. He received the Young Investigator Award and the Julius Axelrod Award from the Society of Neurosciences, the Santiago Grisolia Award, and is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the United States National Academy of Sciences in 2004, the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences in 2011, and a fellow of the American uh, Association for the Advancement of Sciences and a uh, great friend and colleague, and it's a delight to have you uh, join us this morning, this afternoon. Well, I have a tough job here to, to um, describe Saul Snyder's impact on neuroscience. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, um, his CV is hundreds of pages long, and um, it's hard to cap you know, capture that in a, in a short speech. Um, so Saul is the Distinguished Service Professor of Neuroscience, Pharmacology, and Psychiatry in the Department of Neuroscience at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He has been a faculty member at Johns Hopkins for uh, almost 50 years and rose up uh, in the ranks from assistant to full professor in a record four years, going from assistant professor to full t uh, tenured professor uh, within, uh, from 1966 to 1970. Um, Paul, uh, Saul uh, discovered or uh, was a founder and director of the Department of Neuroscience in 1980 to 2005 and endowed the department, as many of you know, in 2006, uh, which we now proudly call the Solomon H. Snyder Department of, of Neuroscience. Saul has um, published over a thousand papers. Um, his H factor in this time of quantitative analysis of impact is uh, incalculable. My computer crashes when I try to uh, calculate it. Um, he, um, Saul has been a really a dominant figure in neuroscience for over four decades. In his pi pioneering work identifying opiate receptors, he differentiated agonists and antagonists, uh, pointing to links of the drug binding sites to second messengers, affording a means for new drug identification, and crystallized the concept that psychoactive drugs uh, exert their pharmacological actions through endogenous uh, neurotransmitters uh, receptors. This is a very appropriate uh, discovery uh, considering the endowed chairs today uh, on the, the Pain Institute. His work through uh, receptors and endogenous, uh, his work on audiographic localization of receptors elucidated how opiates exert their pharmacological influences uh, using receptor binding as a, a binding assay, uh, which we fondly call the grind and bind uh, approach, 
Uh, he identified endogenous opiate ep uh, peptides, obtained uh, the encephalon structures uh, shortly following Hughes and Kosterlix. He then extended receptor binding techniques to all the major neurotransmitter receptors in the brain and explained the, the actions of prominent drug classes such as the antipsychotic effects of neuroleptics that block dopamine receptors. His differentiation of subtypes of serotonin receptors with distinct behavioral functions opened up the field of serotonin research and allowed for the development of uh, uh, SSRIs. He extended receptor binding strategies to the second messenger's uh, IP3, purifying the IP3 receptor to homogeneity and demonstrating its incorporation uh, uh, IP3 recognition site and calcium ion channel. Salt changed dramatically our conceptualization of neurotransmitter in his discovery of nitric oxide, a gas, as a neurotransmitter with functions ranging from aggressive behavior uh, to penile erection. He showed that other gases, such as carbon monoxide, and more recently, hydrogen sulfide are also important signaling molecules. Even more radical was this dis discovery of D isomers of amino acids, especially D serine, are neurotransmitters, neuromodulators in the brain. He showed that D serine, largely localized to astrocytes in sheathing synapses, is the predominant endogenous agonist for the glycine site of the NMDA receptors and uh, formed by serine racemase, which converts L to D serine. For all these reasons, uh, Saul is a legend in, in neuroscience. Uh, Saul has won many, many awards, um, too, too many to, to uh, count. Uh, of course, the Lasker Award, uh, the Albany Prize, um, the, uh, very recently the Warren Albert Prize, uh, the National Medal of Science. He's a member, of course, of the National Academy of Sciences, the Institute of Medicine, um, and, and many, many other uh, 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 professional societies. His um, um, He's had uh, honorary awards from uh, uh, countless numbers of universities a as well. So on a personal note, um, I want to say that Saul has been a mentor to me over the last 25 years. Um, he um, groomed me for the job uh, to take over it went after he stepped down in 2005. So I really uh, owe a lot uh, of my career to him. Um, and I think Saul would n not, uh, he wouldn't forgive me unless I mentioned that Saul is a loving, uh, husband, um, father, and a very, very loving uh, grandfather. So, that's all. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Rick. Uh, I, I came to Johns Hopkins in um, July 1, 1965 for my psychiatry residency. And uh, I joined the faculty the, a year later while I was still a psychiatry resident. Um, and over these uh, lot of years that I've been on the faculty, uh, there have been two things that mattered. Uh, one was uh, just trying to make discoveries, and, uh, and that's, you get a high from it. For those of you who aren't in research, it's better than shooting heroin. <laughs> the, uh, speaking of pain and pain perception. <laughs> uh, and equally, more, equally important is uh, the interaction with students. Uh, I just adore students. Uh, when Hopkins set up a system in which uh, there were mentors for every, every single freshman medical student was assigned uh, an advisor, I signed up for the program and took on probably more advisees than uh, anyone else. And uh, one of my advisees arrived in September of 1987 uh, a little boy from Penn State named Michael Katerina. And uh, he was just so sweet and thoughtful. It was such a pleasure. I would have him, like the other advisees, over to the office to just have lunch together. And it was clear that uh, he, a person like that should become a psychiatrist. And he said, I like research. I said, oh. Uh, well, you know, here's what we do in our lab. We do and assign opiate receptors and endorphins and all that. And uh, he said, yeah, okay, thank you very much. And he did his, and his PhD research instead with Peter Devriotis, a faculty member uh, who's currently the head of the Department of Cell Biology. And he did an utterly brilliant piece of work. It was a joy to follow along with him all the discoveries he was making. And then uh, it came time for him to graduate, and I said, so where are you going to do 
residency. I, I, I'm sure you'll be a psychiatry resident because you're such a wonderful, warm, caring human being. And he said, no, I don't want to do any house staff training. I love research so much. I'm not going to do any further clinical training. I just want to uh, find me a nice postdoctoral fellowship. And I said, oh, yeah, uh, like uh, here at 725 North Wolf Street. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, I've been thinking of moving to San Francisco. And indeed, he meant to move to San Francisco uh, to work with David Julius. Um, uh, to give you a feel for what kind of a student he was, let me read to you. When I, besides meeting with my advisees, I would periodically write them summaries of what we had talked about. And uh, here's a letter dated March 14, 1988, uh, right after Michael had finished the first semester of freshman year of medical student. Uh, Dear Mike, as your advisor, I received periodic re reports of your performance. I just got in the mail the record of your grade for the very first semester of medical school. I don't know whether you've seen them yourself already. In brief, your lowest grade is an A, and you have several A pluses. I don't think I have seen a more impressive grade record for a medical student in the last five years, and indeed, I've been informed that you are the number one student in your class. Um, and he stayed as the number one student in his class for quite a while. And uh, uh, in San Francisco, he did extraordinary things that you've heard about already. I will never forget getting the major scientific journal, Nature, which on the front cover always has pictures of something that's supposed to be photogenic. Um, and this issue of Nature had a big picture of the bell pepper and other kinds of peppers all linked together because the highlighted article for that major issue of the top scientific journal was Michael Katerina's discovery of the capsaicin receptor, the receptor for the initiation of pain, especially for the pain elicited by the active ingredient in bell peppers, capsaicin. And um, it's been a joy to uh, have mentored uh, in a small way Michael Caterina, even though he never wanted to work with me. <laughs> but I still value him as a colleague uh, who has an appointment in our Department of Neuroscience. And, uh, and it's a great honor for me to have this professorship named today. Thank you. Many people have asked me why in the neurosurgery department do we have a Sal Snyder uh, chair, and I can just tell you that th there is nobody that we hold in higher esteem or admiration or awe um, than Sal Snyder. And for a pain institute to have the leading scientist uh, who uh, really made the most fundamental scientific discoveries about pain is an extraordinary honor for us. And I have to just say on a personal level, since I've been here since 1984, that nobody uh, at Hopkins has been more of a impactful personal mentor um, and guidance person for me than, than Sal has, both with the work on Gliadel, which he enormously was influential about and always believed in and always made sure it happened, and my neighbor down the hall on the Hunterian Laboratory uh, where I would come over and then through many, many processes then. Sal has been a true unsung hero. He's a great hero worldwide and in the institution, but for neurosurgery, he's been very quietly behind the scenes, always been our greatest supporter and inspiration. And nothing makes me personally happier than to have a permanent recognition uh, and linkage of that uh, extraordinary relationship with Sal Snyder as part of the legacy that we have here in the neurosurgery department. Um, I have the, um, to introduce formally the inaugural holder of the Salman Snyder Chair in Neurosurgery, we are very fortunate and very honored to have with us today Dr. David Julius and his wife, Dr. Holly Ingraham. Dr. Julius is professor and chair of the Department of Physiology at the University of California, San Francisco, which you've already heard is the lab 
that, that uh, Michael uh, chose over any Hopkins laboratories. He's a world-renowned expert on the molecular and physiological basis of pain and temperature sensation. In his laboratory over the years has discovered multiple molecules involved in these processes. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and has won many major uh, international awards, including the Shaw Foundation Prize and the Paul Janssen Award for Biomedical Research. And as you've heard, he was Dr. Katerina's postdoctoral fellowship mentor, and we're very, very honored to welcome you here and have you introduce our inaugural Sal Snyder Chair. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to introduce Mike uh, as the inaugural uh, holder of the Saul Snyder Professorship in Neurosurgery. This is really a great moment for me and a, and a great pleasure to be here. I think um, this is really an inspired choice for Mike to hold this professorship for a number of reasons. Um, first, as we've heard, Saul uh, holds the moniker of the godfather of modern neuropharmacology. Saul, I think we should start this tradition today where we all kiss your ring in your presence uh, when we see you. Um, and, uh, and Saul uh, has really earned this place in part because of his use, his brilliant use of natural products and other drugs, uh, natural products such as morphine, um, ergot alkaloids, and strychnine to discover key signaling components of the, of the nervous system, particularly receptors and ion channels. Uh, and, and in doing so, um, Saul has really laid out a roadmap that Mike and I have followed in our own careers uh, to discover important molecules and signaling pathways uh, in the nervous system, particularly as this relates to pain sensation. Uh, secondly, as Saul told you, he was Mike's mentor, but I think the thing that he forgot to tell you is that it was really largely because of his um, uh, urging and suggestion that Mike sought out my lab for postdoctoral studies. So um, thank you, Saul. Uh, as a proud, uh, one of Mike's proud uh, scientific parents, this has really been the gift that keeps on giving. And, uh, and now, um, when Mike came to my lab in about 1995, uh, he initiated a set of studies that you've heard a little bit about today. Let me just expand on them briefly. Uh, that um, really, I think, opened up a new era in pain research, at least at the molecular level. And when Mike came to my lab, he similarly, like Saul, exploited natural products, in this case, capsaicin, the main ingredient, pungent ingredient in chili peppers. Uh, as a pharmacological probe for discovering an ion channel that we've heard about called TRIP-V1, uh, which turns out to be a, a really important player in pain sensation, uh, in acute pain sensation and persistent pain, uh, that um, is involved in not only enabling us to sense uh, changes in ambient temperature, namely to detect heat, but also as a molecular um, target for many inflammatory agents that contribute to persistent pain syndromes. And these studies by Mike um, sort of laid out an intellectual framework for understanding how pain is perceived, how the sensory nerve fiber operates, and perhaps most importantly in realizing that these molecules, such as TRIP-V1, are not only sensors for acute pain, but play a tremendous role in, uh, in, in the ability of, uh, of the body through, through changes that occur in response to tissue inju 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 injury to change the setting and the uh, signaling properties of the sensory nerve fiber itself, and in this way to contribute very significantly to chronic pain syndromes. And if, as we've already heard, um, diminishing uh, pain at its source, diminishing acute pain can have a dramatic effect on the outcome of chronic pain situations and of resolution of pre preventing chronic pain situations uh, in a number of uh, tissue injury settings. And I think Mike's work was really uh, some of the initial work that helped refocus attention on the primary afferent nerve fiber as a very uh, compelling place of action for analgesic drugs that could be used to treat a variety of chronic pain syndromes with the notion that stopping pain at its source is a way of stopping a cascade of events that eventually engender and lead to chronic pain syndrome. So uh, to the extent that, um, that citations are, are an index of the impact of scientific discovery. I would say that Mike's uh, seminal paper on the cloning and identification of TRIP-V1 when he's my lab is cited something like 4,000 times, which is tremendous, in or over 4,000 times, which is really a tremendous index uh, in, in the basic science field. And I think this reflects the fact that, aside from its intrinsic interest in import, it's had a huge effect on how we think about pain, not only at the basic research level, but at the clinical level as well. Now, 
Uh, the other thing that I think marked M Mike's time in my lab was not just his discovery, but his demeanor. So uh, Mike made this stupendous discovery that really uh, set both his lab and my lab on this, uh, on this many decades long um, uh, uh, joyful ride in understanding basic aspects of pain sensation. But uh, many people uh, who would make such a discovery as a postdoctoral fellow would try and surround it all and sort of lie on top of it all and keep it to themselves in a way. Um, anyone who knows Mike knows that this is antithetical to his uh, personality makeup. And instead, he threw the doors wide open and, uh, and welcomed everybody in my lab to participate in this, uh, not only to help further the scientific discovery, but to provide them with a, uh, a, a road of their own, a roadmap of their own to initiate their own careers and go out and become successful colleagues who now uh, are successful colleagues of ours and great friends. So Mike has this uh, amazing capability of being sunny at all times, of being incredibly supportive, incredibly helpful, uh, and to have this very broad and long distance vision. And I think that's why uh, as director of this new center, he's the, he's the perfect choice for this. Uh, now, Mike could have gone anywhere that he wanted to. In fact, he could have stayed at UCSF, but in the flip side, we were not able to uh, retain him there. And instead, he chose to return to Hopkins. And, uh, and I think this is in large part because his experience here was so wonderful uh, that he has great allegiance and love for this institution. And, um, and it's perhaps our loss, but your great fortune that you treated him so well that he chose to come back here. Um, so let me just uh, end by congratulating Mike. Now, Mike is not the absolutely perfect individual. I've given you the impression that it, I, I was just thinking about, is there anything about Mike? Now, Mike hasn't aged at all. I was, my wife, Holly, said, you should show a picture of Mike uh, when he was in your lab. And I thought about doing that, but he hasn't changed at all. So it would sort of be a boring comparison. It's a little bit more gray hair, maybe, but that's about it. Uh, but one day, Mike said, oh, do you need a ride? I, I told him I needed a ride somewhere. She said, OK, let's go find my car. It's parked in Golden Gate Park. So I went with him to find his car. And, um, and as we're walking down the street, I see this car parked on the side of the road. Now, Mike is always so kempt and you know, good looking, and everything's always together, and he's such a together person. And as we walk by this car, I notice that there's, there's a car in the back seat that's just piled high with papers. And they're like wrappers from McDonald's or something like that. And all of a sudden, very unexpectedly, he stops and opens the door to this car. This is Mike's car. And I get in the car, and I'm sort of befuddled because I've never seen the side of Mike. And he said, well, this is breakfast on the way in, and I have breakfast and psh, in the back seat. So I, I hesitate to tell that story in front of his parents. Uh, but the reason I say it is because this is the only flaw, in, potential flaw, in Mike's character that I have ever been able to see. He's, and he's also married to a fantastic woman, Kathy. And so, um, uh, but I always sort of keep that as a remembrance that um, Mike is not perfect, <laughs> as much as I'd like to think he is. But that's about as deep as I can go. So anyway, congratulations, Mike. Congratulations to you all for uh, putting these two wonderful people who are really sort of uh, idols to me, Mike and Saul Snyder, and put them together in this, in this beautiful way. And thank you for inviting me to share this with you. Well, I figured I'd take my own advice and write things down, because otherwise Alan would get mad at me. First off, thank you, David, for, for that warm and wonderful introduction. It's, it's over the top. And uh, uh, the only thing that's true about it is my car was messy. So that, that, that part is absolutely true. Um, I'd like to thank David for, for, for the kind introduction to him and his wife, Holly, for, for coming all the way uh, from California for today's events. Um, thank you to David for, for allowing me to be a part of just one of many exciting uh, and groundbreaking discoveries that have emanated from his lab over the years. It's just, just been inspiring to be a part of, to, be, to watch from a distance, um, and for, also for being an amazing scientific role model and for all of his support uh, that has continued well beyond the time I was in his lab uh, and, and up to this day. I had, I had a great deal of fun working with him and, and creating with him, and, and, and uh, that really has set the tone for you know, one of the reasons I've enjoyed science as much as I have. 
Uh, thank you also to uh, President Daniels and Dean Rothman for, for coming today. Thank you for supporting the creation of endowed professorships here at Hopkins and, 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 and supporting them to allow the scientific freedom and, and the, the potential that, that they hold uh, for really fundamentally changing the practice of medicine. Um, a heartfelt congratulations and thanks uh, to, to Dr. Solomon Snyder. Um, the existence of an endowed professorship in Saul's name uh, is highly appropriate. Uh, it's an honor for the Department of Neurosurgery to be able to be involved in this, um, and an honor for, I believe, for the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and the university. Um, Saul, as, as you've already heard, uh, is, is a giant uh, in the field, and, and that's, that's an understatement. Um, Saul has basically created the field of molecular neurobiology. I don't think it's, it's, it's too much of an overstatement to say that, uh, and has created what is probably the, the strongest uh, neuroscience department uh, in the world, um, and, and his impact has, has really gone far beyond the laboratory. Um, he also, on a, on a more personal level, um, I thank him for his mentorship at every single stage of my professional career, uh, not just in those early days when I was trying to figure out what to do when I arrived at Johns Hopkins, but basically it's not, it, it's not too much to say that every time I've had a major decision to make in my professional career, um, the first person I've turned to to ask questions about what I should be doing next, um, whether it's what lab to work in, whether it's whether to do a residency, whether it's where to do my postdoc, whether to come back to Hopkins, whether to take the position at the Institute, what have you. Every time I've had a decision to make, I've turned to Saul, and he's been very generous with his time, generous with his wisdom, uh, and also mixes care about one's professional career with care about one's personal life and one's family, and that really has exemplified him. Uh, and so I am, uh, as a result, I am indescribably honored to have my name associated with his in any way, shape, or form, uh, let alone with this uh, incredibly humbling uh, and special manner that we're celebrating today. So thank you, Saul. Also, uh, a special thanks to the uh, Neurosurgery Pain Research Department's uh, donors. Um, I cannot overstate how important their contribution has been uh, to all of us being here today and to what we can accomplish in the future. Uh, I, I thank them for making possible these professorships, but more importantly, for making possible the existence of the, of the Nurse Surgery Pain Institute itself. Um, this is really, I, I, it's, it's hard to express how much of an unprecedented enterprise this is. Um, the opportunity to bring together the remarkably vast talent, uh, pool of talent that we have here at Johns Hopkins, everything from the laboratory into the clinic and everything in between, there's an enormous wealth of talent related to pain research here. Uh, but until the creation of this institute, it was very difficult to bring that together and, and, and really allow it to exert its full potential. And I think that this gift has done that. Um, and, and it's done that in order to focus in on one singular and crystal clear goal. And that is to control, prevent, and eliminate pain, as the name implies. Um, we couldn't even think of tackling this kind of an ambitious uh, goal um, without the donor's exceptional generosity and sense of purpose. And that sense of purpose, which was conveyed to Dr. Brem and then conveyed to Dr. Belsberg and myself, um, has been contagious and it drives us daily uh, and, and it's, we're incredibly determined to make this endeavor a success. I'd like to thank Dr. Brem uh, first of all, for having the confidence in me to bring me on in the Institute. Uh, uh, you know, he didn't know me from Adam at the beginning, and, 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 and he really has had a lot of faith in me. He also uh, got me excited about this shift in my career. I mean, I was happy to toil away in my lab with my little mice and, and do my thing, but, but he really instilled a vision uh, that we could do something that would have a much broader impact. Um, uh, with this sort of exceptional mechanism. And, I, and I'm eternally grateful to him for, for, for allowing me to, to be a part of this. Um, I'm also grateful for him for giving me and Alan the freedom and the resources to craft and implement a vision with his help um, that will allow us to fulfill the challenging mission laid out by the donor. Um, it's one thing to bring in directors of an institute, but it's another one to basically give them enough rope to hang themselves. And, then, and that's sort of what, what he's done by, by bringing resources to bear, by, by helping us through tough spots as we're trying to decide whether to zig or to zag. 
um, um, he's really made it uh, so that uh, we'll be limited by our own capabilities uh, in moving this institute forward. Uh, and finally, I'd like to congratulate him for the establishment of the Henry Brent Professorship, um, and, uh, which is very well deserved and, and another special honor for our department. So thank you. Um, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Ellen Bellsberg and congratulate him today uh, on, on his well-deserved appointment to the Hoyer Professorship. I'm, 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 I'm very excited about this. And, and also, I'd like to thank him for his brilliance, energy, and keen judgment. And, and I don't choose those words lightly. I think every one of them, uh, 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 as anyone who knows Alan uh, will tell you, um, are, are, are not understatements. Um, basically, Alan has a very rare insight into both the scientific side of pain and the medical side of pain. And, and it's, it's highly unusual that you would find someone who can blend those two things. Um, and, and as a result of that and, and the energy and, and, and intelligence that he brings to his work, um, I really could not ask for a better partner in crime in this, in this endeavor. And, 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 and I'm very happy to be working together with him. Um, thanks to our pain research collaborators, we heard a few of them mentioned earlier, uh, Bobby Norris, uh, Xinjiang Dong, Xiaobu Ye, but there's a, another list, and I'd be here uh, for, the, for the rest of the evening uh, uh, lay, laying out the names for you. Um, but basically, we're surrounded by brilliance in this place, um, and these collaborators bring an unparalleled breadth and depth of talent to the study of pain. It's what I think is the ultimate fuel that's going to make this institute successful, together with the, unusual, the exceptional resources that we have. Um, and, and I thank them for generously providing both their data and their time to the mission of the institute. Um, and they're going to be key to the institute's future success. Um, I also want to uh, uh, highlight uh, several pioneers in pain research here at Johns Hopkins. You heard uh, some of these names before. Uh, Jim Campbell, uh, Dick Meyer, Srinivasa Raja, and also uh, at, uh, at the name of Jack, the late Jack Griffin, uh, the former chair of, of, of neurology here. Um, these are individuals who, over the years, over several decades, made innumerable fundamental discoveries of pain. And the real importance of those discoveries is real only now being recognized by the rest of the field as the rest of the field has caught up with their very precocious thinking. Um, and I thank them for making a pain research a priority here at Hopkins. I thank them for their extraordinary mentorship to me, uh, all the stimulating scientific dis discussion uh, that they've generated, uh, and their endless encouragement, uh, both personal and professional. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, 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 Brenda Nair and Shawana Jackson, who are the Institute's former and current administrative coordinators. They are really um, uh, uh, the glue that has held this institute together, and, if, and their energy and their efficiency has helped to define what the institute is to keep it on track and moving forward uh, efficiently and creatively. Um, I'd like to thank our scientific advisory board, the Institute Scientific Advisory Board. We basically have a dream team of experts here that we can turn to at the drop of a hat uh, uh, to guide us through uh, uh, challenging problems. Um, and, and finally, our, our, the, the Department of Neurosurgery, the faculty and the administration who have welcomed me into the department when I came over from biological chemistry um, and have done everything possible to make the Institute a success. Now, as I mentioned, I am a transplant from a, a basic science department, from biological chemistry, um, and, and uh, I'm fortunate enough to enjoy multiple citizenship uh, with, with neurosurgery, biological chemistry, uh, and neuroscience. And so, uh, although he unfortunately can't be here today, I'd like to thank Jerry Hart, the chair of the Department of Biological Chemistry. He recruited me back to Hopkins as a faculty member. He has done everything possible to facilitate the development of my career and my lab. Um, he's looked out for, for our interests under all circumstances, even when it included making the decision to move to a different department. He's been eminently supportive, uh, and I'm eternally grateful. And I'd also like to thank uh, my fellow faculty and, and the administration of the Department of Biological Chemistry, both past and present. Some of them are here today, and they've served as invaluable mentors, as collaborators, and as friends to me, and taught me how to do science. Uh, and speaking of teaching me how to do science, uh, in addition to, to David Julius, uh, I've been, I've been, I've been uh, uh, incredibly uh, uh, fortunate to have both him and another great mentor, Peter Devriotis, uh, who's currently the chair of cell biology here at Hopkins. He's my graduate school mentor who can teach, continues to teach me about science uh, and about mixing science and life. Um, and, and Rick Huguenier, whom we heard before, who's the chair 
of neurosurgery, I mean, of neuroscience. Uh, sorry, Henry. <laughs> but uh, Rick is the chair of neuroscience where I have a joint appointment, and he's been nothing but supportive uh, at all stages of my career here. Um, finally, I want to close with two groups of people who are ultimately responsible for anything good that, that comes out of my lab or out of my professional career. First of all, the members of my laboratory. Um, I've had an unbelievably talented group of students, postdocs, and technicians, both past and present, um, who, uh, I don't know how they find themselves to me, but I've been incredibly lucky. They work ridiculously hard, they work creatively, they're responsible for every bit of accomplishment that's come out of the lab. Uh, they teach me as much as I teach them. Um, and they've been very patient and understanding with me, particularly over the last year or so, when uh, they're working hard in the lab, taking care of the nitty gritty things uh, while I'm out having coffee with Alan. So, so I thank them for everything that they've done. Uh, and then finally, uh, uh, and, 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 and uh, uh, perhaps most importantly, my family, uh, my mother and father, Augusta and Batista, uh, my wife, Kathy, uh, uh, my sister, Lori, and her family, uh, my in-laws, the Keelan family. Uh, I cannot tell you how much uh, uh, endless uh, support, love, uh, and as any of you will know me, uh, extraordinary patience uh, it's taken for them to, uh, to, to stand behind me, and I'm eternally grateful. Uh, and then finally, uh, just to close out the day, I thank all of you for being here this, this afternoon's events, for sharing this uh, exciting occasion with us, and uh, thank you for your attention. Well, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today and for sharing this very special moment in the history of neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins. Please join us for a reception in the lobby, and thank you all very much.